<clears throat> How are you doing, Beethoven? I'm okay, thanks for asking. Hi, everyone. How are you? Yeah, I know. It's busy all the way around. Busy for me too. I try to catch up with some grading today. This class is a big class, so I'm still not able to get through unit 10 yet. I got most of it done. <clears throat> so let's check out. <laughs> The life of the students, right? Yeah, but soon enough, you will finish the semester. So just keep working on it. I know. I heard that. Well, when we had a meeting, the high school students, they were telling me that their teacher gave them extra work because it's online. So Everybody feels overwhelmed online, so. Well, at least for this class, we only have one thing to do this week, which is awesome. Then you can work on your project if you have time or study for your other classes. Hey, Professor, so on Thursday, you said um, you're not gonna be in class, but you're gonna be here for like the first couple of minutes, just in case we have questions. Or no, I have, I'll be available until like 7.30, after 7.30. I'll be available from six till regular time. So if you have questions, you can pop in. Oh, so you're just gonna like, if no one's here, you're just gonna be like working on yep. assignments during that time or something? Yeah, I, I do that for office hours all the time. I turn on Zoom and I sit there and I grade or I answer email or, I always have things to do, <laughs> but uh, I can multitask, so not a problem. Yeah, so if you have questions or your team have questions, you can pop in and ask questions. Okay. And you said for the first part of the assignment, you just want us to write out like the pseudo code of the program and answer that document page? Yeah, so, so the, yeah, so basically you are going to plan out your your program. So pick the, the one that you want to do and then fill out the document, write your pseudocode, and then you can start writing the program. And all of that can be done within the next few weeks. And so you can study for your finals for your other class. Or if you wait till the last two weeks, it can be very stressful all the way around. So yeah. All the projects is coming now because it's the end. I got to release my project for my networking class. I haven't finished my network layout. So they have to Hello, write. Dr. K. Hi, Ryan. How are you? I got my uh, second dose of the vaccine today. Oh, how are you feeling? Right now, just a bit of soreness in my arm. Yeah, I hope it doesn't hit you as hard as it hit me. I like later that night because I got it at 1 p.m. and later that night like I just I was just in bed I couldn't get up but because I was lacking sleep too so while you're studying at 4 a.m. in the morning guess what I'm doing <laughs> I'm writing curriculum or other things so uh yeah but yeah you need to rest drink a lot of water that's gonna help you juice and water all right, everyone, welcome back. We're going to have a light week this week. So we're wrapping up some of the lecture this week. Um, like I mentioned last week, um, on Thursday, I will be available doing our regular session. So I'm here. In case you have questions, you can pop in or not. If you don't have questions and you want to just catch up with your work or studying for your other class, um, we no longer have lab. If you look at the lab manual that Cal State and, and some of the university is using that I use, um, there is one more lab and it's a little bit more advanced. It uses recursive function. 
um, if you want to attempt it, you can look at it. Um, I posted the lab manual in the first module for your course resources, or if you email me, I can give you the manual in PDF. Um, that's the same one that University of Pennsylvania is using, Texas is using, all the university, um, including, um, including Stanford is using it. So um, LC3 is a very common uh, language to teach in assembly because it's the easiest to digest and it's similar to other languages. So once you get it, you know, it's like learning C++. Like once you learn C++, you can learn other language easily um, and or C, right, vice versa. So today I'm going to go over some of the lecture um, and then if you have questions, I'll stick around for questions um, and then on Thursday, if you have questions about your project, you can pop in, but please work on your missing assignments if you have them. Um, I started grading. I know that I'm still on unit 10 assignments and I saw that half of the class turned in the lab. So um, watch the video, go through it, um, complete it. Um, one thing that I wanna know, so I mentioned this before and I probably mentioned it in my CIS 7 class, but when you use, um, text editor or like Word document and you type up your code and when you copy and paste it over to LC3 editor because it's using a different encoding system, um, you might have symbols and things that don't match up and it's gonna throw error. So if you run into errors, the way that you debug it is to go back and retype some of the symbols like quotation marks, period, semicolon, um, and even in some of the letters, it doesn't pick up. It depends on what kind of application you're using. So, um, so just keep in mind that if you write out your code in, in an application like Word or a text editor, um, it, when you transfer it to LC3, it might run into problems. So you just gotta you know, fix the typing and you should be all right, okay? So um, let me get to my thing and I will share screen. Do you have any questions before we start? Okay, so let's share screen real quick. So this week we are gonna cover chapter 14 and 16. If you're doing the reading, that's the reading for this week. Um, and just like last week, it's gonna look at, we're gonna look at the parallel in C and how that it will be in C, LC3. So that way it will be easier to understand. And we are gonna go look at pointers, uh, functions, array in C and the LC3 equivalents. I will post the video for today um, on this page. You have an assignment for this week and that's the only thing that we're gonna be doing. Um, so use your time effectively, okay? Work on your project, work on your other classes, work on your missing assignments, submit them. Um, I do have a close in all late work. Um, it's gonna be about a month from now, the end of, or the first week of June. I don't take anything beyond that point that will be late. I would only take the things that are due, like your projects, your final review, things like that. So let's let's try to make sure that um, just trickle them in, that's fine. Um, and then, thank you for that, for about Notepad++. Um, and then if you have any questions or if you have difficulty, you can always find me. Um, I will be in the lab session on Zoom. So if you need help or if you wanted me to look at your program, I will be happy to do that. Um, we do have another lecture session which is gonna be for 17 and 19. And there is also no lab. You will have a quiz review uh, requirement for next week. Um, I will open up the quiz in the following week. And after unit 12, um, week 13 and 14, I will dedicate the lecture time to covering your final review. Um, you can pop in, we, we will go through every single question starting from week one all the way till chapter 19. Um, because you will have a final exam, it's gonna be multiple choice. However, it's 50 questions and sometimes looking back, you might've forgotten some material. So um, I've been teaching for well over 15 years 
and I always do final review with all my classes, even graduate classes. So, um, and I found it really helpful for the students because, you know, life happens and sometimes you shelf away some of the concept that we learned earlier in the semester. So um, you should come in, do the assignments with me, and then you can turn it in and use it to study and then work on your project, okay? So as I know, you all of you have physics and calculus and other classes that you worry about too. So we wanted to keep it light and, and, and easy. All right, any question? Okay, so in, um, let's look at your notes real quick. I posted the presentation, some of the materials on the presentation is gonna be on your notes as well. Um, so you can look at either or. So in chapter 14, it comes back and it talks about functions. And um, when we say functions in C, we would refer to subroutine in LC3. Um, we spent quite a few weeks on this, but we wanted to look at you know, how we would be using C and then the equivalent in LC3. So in C, when you have, when you declare your function, function is just a way that we would be able to um, complete a task, okay? And you can prototype your function and that usually goes to the top of your program. So basically in, in BC, C++, Java, you have to use type. So in your declaration, you have to say what type it is. So if you're using int in the parameter, you got to give int here. So you would have int as a type for the example. And you can use double if you wanted to use double for the type or long, you know, so you have to give it a type, char, etc. And we want to give it a name and the name, just like all the identifier, we want it to be unique and it cannot be keywords. Then for your arguments inside the parentheses here, you also need to include the type and then you can pass array, variable, etc., in your argument, okay? So here we're gonna use int n as the argument. Then, um, for the function call, this happens in the main. So down, further down in the program, you can call the function unless it calls itself for recursion. Then you would, it would happen at, within the function uh, at the end of that function. So that way you can call itself there. Um, then this right here, we would then use the function call and that is just an expression. So you would don't you don't put the, the type when you call the function, you just use the name, right? And then so here we would see that we would return the value in the expression. And when it executes the function, it's gonna give us the value. And so the first thing it's gonna do is gonna evaluate the arguments that you're setting up here for the function call, and then it's gonna execute the function, it's gonna return the value from in the expression. So the important part is to make sure that we define our function. So we prototype it at the top, right? We would implement the function call, then we would define the function, what it's doing, okay? So here we just need to also include the type, right? The um, argument. And you notice that when we prototype in C, you use the semicolon. And when you define a function in C, you don't include the semicolon, right? So that distinguish between prototyping and defining, okay? Now, if you are familiar with Python, it's easier right? We just do a def and then we would put the function name and its argument and then its body. And then in when you call, there is a main, right? Uh, but you just, usually you don't say main, you just 
put the name of the function and how you want to call it. You can print it through the call. You can do a lot of different things. So it's it's simplifying the process a little bit. The concept is the same. You still have to define the function. So in this one, what, what we're doing here is we're implementing a for loop with it, right? So you need to declare int i, use that, use that variable, you have to declare it somewhere, right? And when you declare it within the function body, it's only gonna be used within that, right? So we're only gonna use i within this function. And then we would have result and we initialize that at one, we implemented a for loop and for loop has three parts. We talked about that last time and we would have it starts at one, it's gonna go up to n and it's gonna update by incrementing. And then we are going to use result and we use compound assignment here. So result is gonna be equal to itself multiplied by i and we're gonna return the result. Okay, so that's the definition of the function. Now, um, with this, what we want, in, and the whole point in using function, and we don't have to return from the function every time, right? Um, but for most cases, we want to return a value from the function. That's the, the point. And when you look at that in LC3, while it's not high level like this, right, you still have to define the function. And the way that we put it into LC3, we would have a label called factorial, right? And then we would then add i to the register. Okay, so when you initialize int i here on that line, you have to think, oh, that's when I'm just going to make sure that I load i into the register. And then I want to add one into the result or load result and then add one to it. So every single line that you see in C should give you the equivalent in LC3, maybe multiple lines sometimes, or just one, right? So when you look at C code, you should be able to say, oh, I can do the same in LC3. It's gonna be like this, okay, at this point. And then with the for loop, right, we wanted to, because I is gonna be our keeping count. So we are, but, we have to also take consideration of what n would be, right? So if you fill n somewhere, you can use it, or the way that we can do it is we can introduce n at that point, okay? So then we would add one to i. So when you look at LC3, this, these parts right here needs to be broken into separate line of code. Okay, or multiple lines. It's gonna help. And we have to branch here, okay? So when you look at this for loop, you're gonna say, oh, I'm gonna put one into where the register for I, so I'm gonna just add it. And then I wanted to make sure that I do a branch when I need to check. So I need to bring N into a register so I can branch it and check to see if it's, you know, greater and equal to that number. And then I'm gonna update it by counting up, okay? So we're gonna increment it. And then, so when we have results, then here we're gonna do a multiply. So ideally you would call a subroutine for multiplication if it's complex multiplication. If it's easy and you can handle it with addition, you can do that. Right, but in this case, as it's looping, right, we wanted to, we can then call another function with it. So you would have to do a JSR, okay? Because it's result is result times I, okay? And then you are gonna return the result. So we are gonna do an RET and then we want to save it, right? If you, if you store it to start, then you need to load it at that point, okay? So when you look at this, you say, oh, okay, these are the steps that I need to do in LC3. Okay. So now um, let's answer some questions to start. So for number one, it asks you the purpose of functions in C programming. 
So in C, function provides abstraction. It hides low level details. It gives high level structure of the program. It allows the programmer to control the overall program flow, enables separable independent development. So yeah, that's the highlight that that's what's given in the notes. But function is used to achieve a task whether you return from it or not, okay? And that will be method in, in Python, right? And function in C++ and subroutine in LC3, same thing. So when, when we have that function, when it executes it, depending on the type of functions, right? The compiler is gonna handle that when it executes it and it's gonna require system call, system access with that. And we touched on that like a couple of weeks ago. And when it completes, it's gonna give you back your program. It's gonna pick up where it's left off. And in LC3, we would see this when you do a JSR, right? When you do that function call, what will happen is it's gonna do the trap, right? With R7, if you're returning from it, it's going to save the value to R7. It's going to update the MDR. Then once it's trap out, it's going to clear R7. And so it's going to then bring, it's going to bring in the address of the next instruction to R7. It's going to load that into the MAR and it's going to pick up where it's left off. So in C, we see some of that, what the, we, the compiler handles some of that. And in LC3, we have to look at the actual sequence on what's happening there. Okay. So <clears throat> any question? And it, this it mentions on how you would want your program to flow and you would have to think about that when you implement subroutine with your label in LC3, right? Like how do you want to jump from one function to another? Do you want to just flow straight down or do you want it to send from one function to the next function? Earlier I mentioned that I wanted to call multiple multiply subroutine. So at that point, I'm going to do a JSR molt and I'm gonna send it to the molt section and it's gonna multiply it for me, right? Then after that, it's gonna pick up and it's gonna come back and then it's gonna to go to the next line and the next line and the next line and so on. But it's a good way for us to really control how our program should be flowing. And it's also allowing us to organize our program. All right, so now here it also gives you another example. I took a picture of that there, okay, using double, right? So in the main, we call the, the function value in dollars, okay? And then we would define it on the bottom. Okay, so when we implement a function, we said that we want to do the function call. And for the compiler, this is what's happening in the back, okay? It needs to have information about the function itself, okay? Including the arguments, the local variables, that means that the variable that you declare within that function like int i, okay? And the activation record is going to store on the runtime stack. So it's going to push that onto the stack. Okay, so the compiler handles that. So here it's going to push that activation record onto the stack. It's going to copy the argument value, the values into the arguments for the function call. So that way it knows. Okay. And here, when it gets the result, it's gonna put that result into an activation record. And then it's gonna pop that record from the stack and return. 
So the compiler handles that here. Okay, think of it like the activation record is like a file, just an abstract level of file, right? It's gonna just add that to that section of the memory because it has to update the result. So it would have the result so that way it can return. And when it gets back over here, so it's gonna obtain the result from the stack, then it's gonna pop it from the stack and then it's gonna give you back your program. And if you, know, if you have other functions, other things, then it continues, okay? So now with the runtime, we, when it does this with the, when it push the activation record, it needs to copy the value into the arguments and it also needs to include your local variables, okay? So here it talks about that. So in the next part, it says that your local variables are stored on the runtime stack in the activation record, right? Because that activation record pertains to that function and only that function at that time, okay? So what it does is it's gonna, it's gonna add, it's gonna include the local variables so it knows what variables that you need to use because ultimately when we declare the variable, we associate a space to an identifier, to a name, okay? And whatever the value we store in that, right? It's gonna be put into that location where it's dedicated for that variable. So then when the function is called, the activation is then pushed on the stack and it's going to use, so it's going to take whatever that variable is in a different location and it's going to bring, it's going to copy that. It's going to put it onto a dedicated section of the memory for stack. And it's going to only use that for that section of the memory for the function call. So when it returns, the activation record is then clear off the stack so it can make room for the next, okay? Now the stack is always gonna grow and shrink, okay? And so in the case when it pushed, it's gonna grow, right? And we talked about how LC3, when we implement the abstract level of stack is then we just gonna, we're gonna push it down. So we're gonna do an add one and then when we pop it, we pop it up. So we subtract one, okay? Just like how you push down the coin. So you go a lower one. And then when you pop it, you bring it back up. So then when in that case, we would see the operation like this. And for LC3, we would use the R6, register six, to really check to see if the stack is empty or not, right? And then we would use a register that would be associated with the record or what we call previously in the table because the addresses is gonna relate, it's gonna be tied to that register that's gonna manage it, okay? Okay, so here, this is when we look at the activation record, right, for this function. So think the way that they illustrate this is think of it like a table, okay? That's the easiest way. So when, when it, built, it creates, when it has that record, what it's gonna do is gonna add in your variables. See that? A, B, W, X, and Y, the type, and then the offset. Okay, then um, with this, translate that to what we would be in LC3, you would have those variables loaded based on the instruction because I would do LD or LDI, right? So it would put it on per word here for the local. And then your addresses, your dynamic link, your return, and your return value would be following that. 
and then your arguments. And that is in the stack section. Okay. So after this class, you should be able to visualize what's happening when you're looking at a C++ program, right? Like from now on, when you look at a function, you're going to say, oh, that's what's happening. It puts these variables on, into the memory location on stack, right? And then also it's going to manage the addresses and the return value. And for LC3, that will be a certain register and the arguments. So all of that gets pushed onto the stack. Once it's done calling, it's going to pop it up, get rid of it. Next, right? So in the bookkeeping part, your return value is a space for the value returned from the function allocated. Okay, so when you are returning an integer, that integer is then be there in that space, okay? The return address is a pointer. That's gonna be the next instruction in calling the functions and that's gonna store in register seven in case JS, the, in case another JSR is called. So this address is gonna allow it to point back to where the program should pick up, which is the next instruction. Dynamic link, it tells you here that it's a frame pointer. It's used to pop this activation record from the stack, okay? So that is just mainly used to point to the location for pop, okay? Where that takes up to, and then it's gonna pop from top. Okay. So compared to the LC3, we would see here, okay, you did a lab last week where we push and pop, right? You saw that we would clear the zero, right? So here, when we do the function call, we would add the 10, okay? So when you visualize that, it's gonna put it here. So the Q, the R, the W, dynamic link return address return value and the, the argument all goes here. So R6 is going to reference that and then when it adds it's the R6 is going to be pointing to this right here because it's going to know that 25 was added based on so R6 is like a meter right when you when you push in 25 what that does is it's going to say oh now it has the 25 at the top. Okay. So as I said, when you push down the argument or, or you push the first argument, it's gonna go down one. And then when you pop it, you're gonna bring it up one. Okay, so that gives you the stack illustration. So when we did the minus one here, it's going to go from that to the next one. So it's going to be the return address. And then when we start our five, our six, our zero here, that's associated with the dynamic link that allows us to do what? To point to where, so when it pop, right, where it's going to be picking up. Okay, so for number two, describe the process in runtime stack when calling a function and after it is called. So when the new function is called, its activation record is pushed onto the stack. When it returns, its activation record is popped off the stack. So when you look at a C++ program, you ever seen people doing return return uh, one or return negative one or return. So when you do a return zero, right? You give everything back to the system itself. 
But when you simulate in LC3, after you run the program, I'm gonna illustrate that right now. So let's say I open my LC3 here and I load my pro, oops, sorry, I load my program. Let's say my lab from last week, okay. At the start, you notice that R1 is a negative one, okay? So when you execute this, when it's done, it's also negative one. So when it's not doing anything to start right at the beginning, right? You can clear initial, we can like reinitialize the machine where it clears everything out. Let's say that it's empty right now. And when we load the program, okay? When you run this, okay, you see how this is, okay? So think about that when you, when in association with how you would use a C++ program, okay? So when it's finished, what happens is it's gonna, it's gonna move everything out of stack, it's completed, right? It's gonna return negative one. And that's what's really happening in the background is returning negative one after it completed, executed my program, okay? So that's gonna indicate to the system that right here, this, this X, this hex, the, the, um, the value here is that it's completed, okay? We do see some of the, the resonance of the value. We talked about this earlier in the semester that it, re it stays in the register, right? and we can reinitialize the machine to really clear it out. But these are just temporary, so they can be overwritten at any time in the next round. Okay. So when you look at the simulator, the R1 is always gonna be negative one when it's completed. Okay, so after it finished everything, that's gonna be the return, it's return R1 as negative one compared to your C++. All right, so we talked about how it's pushing on to the stack for the run the runtime and it's pop it off when it's finished the call. When you return the value, return address and dynamic link, which is the section following that, we talked about that. It asks you to describe the functionality of return value, return address, dynamic link in the activation record for the record keeping process. So your return value is the space for the value returned by the function. And this is dedicated even if the function does not have a return value. So when you have a void, right? When you have a void, in C or C++, it's still gonna have that space. Return address is just gonna be the save pointer for the next instruction. So it would be returning address for where the next instruction would be. So it can pick up where it left off. Then your dynamic link is the frame pointer that used to pop the activation record from the stack. So you saw that in the notes when we do an add R5, R5, or add R5, R6, one, right? That's gonna allow us to, to use R6 with one to meter, right? From the top, so that way we can pop it. Any question with these? You can find all of them in the notes. Okay, so here it shows you the end of the Kali function where we would then add the zero for the dynamic link here. And then for the return address, it's going to use R7. So we have to do a load between register. Oops. 
Okay, so to load the return, you can load it by copying or loading from R6 to R0 with by adding a, a decimal zero. So you're gonna bring, R6 has the return value, so you want it to bring it, load it onto register zero. And then once that happens and we need to store, so we would then store from register zero to register five. So register five would then have 217. Okay. Any question with caller function? Okay, so in LC3 procedures and subroutine for the subroutine call implementation equivalent to function call, we talked about how caller pushes the arguments last to first and that get pushed onto the stack. Then it's gonna invoke the subroutine. So when we say invoke subroutine, that just simply is JSR. And then we would use the register to allocate return value. So that's gonna be a push of register seven and five because seven is for the RET student instruction, right? And register five is what we would use as store. And we would allocate space for the variable. So those came from your, those would be in your activation record as it pushes that. Then it executes the function code. It would store the result in the return slot, then cop, then move that over to the register, then register seven, then it's gonna pop the variable and it's gonna pop the values out of the, the register of five and seven. Then it's gonna do a jump. That's all part of the return. Then it's gonna load the value and then pop the argument because now it's done, it doesn't need the argument anymore then it picks up to where the rest of the program would be. Okay. So the process for the subroutine call, we can list those, pushes the arguments. So the caller pushes the argument, the caller invokes the subroutine, callee allocates the return value, pushes R7 and R5. Kali allocates space for local variable that's within that function or a subroutine. Kali executes the function code. It stores the results in the return value location or slot. Then it pop the variables. So pop R5 and R7. Then it does a jump. So for the return, that means that at that point it returns. And then the caller would then load the return value and get rid of the argument by popping. And then it returned to the program where it left off. So it resumed. Question. So all of that happens with subroutine calls. So when you do a JSR, right? Okay, next we're gonna talk about array and pointers. 
I know may, many of you are interested in this area because you wanted to build your array for your project. Okay. So refer to page four and five in the notes for the last questions. So pointer is just an address of a variable in memory, right? We can point to a location that would be for that variable. And that way we can indirectly access that variable. All right, so the confusion in LC3 is that, well, which one is the value and which one is the address, right? When you look at the simulator, okay, when we jump to the location, that's really the address. So let's say that I jump to hex 3100, okay? So see, on the left column, you have the address, and then the middle column would be the value. So when you set the value is that will be here, okay? And they're all hexadecimal, right? So when you look at this, it says the address versus value, sometimes we deal with the address, which is a location, and then sometimes we deal with hexadecimal value, which is what value it would contain at that location. So when I'm saying, when I do a set value, right? Let's say that if I set at the location 3100 and I give it a four like this, I click okay, the value is stored as hex four, hexadecimal four, at this location. Okay. So then when we look at the LC3 program, let's say that we have register two containing the address of the first location. When the program is run, it's gonna read the value and it's going to add and it's going to increment R2 until all the numbers have been processed. So it's going to execute that instruction by looking at what's the content in R2. Okay. And so when we look at this, let's say that at this location we have 3107. So it's going to read the value, which is at 3107. Okay. And then it's going to add that and it's going to increment it. So our, if you point, if you use register two to point to a location, it's only going to be the address. And at that address, you're going to have the value. Okay. So the way that we use an LC3 is we want to say, okay, we wanted to get the address to the register. And that way that we can indirectly access the value, whatever value at that address at that location. Okay, so when you declare a pointer in C++, that's what you're doing is that it needs to get the register to to store the address for the variable that you declare as the pointer. Okay. So here it talks about swap. So it says another use of pointer is to swap the values of its arguments and swap needs addresses of the variable outside of its own activation record. So in the function call, if you do a swap, what it's gonna do is gonna take a temp location 
and it's going to dedicate that because nothing magically happens. Okay. Everything has to do with addresses with the processor. So when, when you're doing a swap, you have to dedicate a temp section so that way you would put the value there, right? For the swap process to, to occur. Otherwise you cannot do it, okay? There's no magic air location. It has to be physical. And that's the way that, that, that we've been using the processor forever, okay? So we want to have a temp location for the swap because it's not included into its activation record. So therefore it needs to be generated as a temp location. Okay. So here is how we do it in C++ or C, right? You declare a pointer. So you would have int and then use the asterisk and then P. So P is a pointer to an int. And with C, we always gonna be pointed to a particular data type because it's a type language, strongly type language. So you always want to include that with the type, okay? And then the operators would be P, asterisk P, that will be returns the value pointed to by P. And then you wanted to use, what do you guys call this, you remember? From C++ days? Reference? Yes, thank you very much. Somebody, <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> I feel like I'm teaching 17A right now, uh, but that's that's fine. C, 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 C plus plus is great. All right, so reference variable, okay? That gives you the address of the variable Z, okay? So two difference, right? So when you look at this, it's gonna be pointed to the location for P where it stores the value compared to when you do a reference variable, it, it would be the returns address of the variable Z, of that variable. Okay, so when we look at the overall program, which is in the following example, right? You declare the PTR here as your pointer Okay, and here we would say that PTR is, right, reference variable I. So it stores the address of I into the memory location that's associated with the PTR. Okay. Then here with the PTR is PTR plus one. So that would be the result that would be stored into the memory at the address stored in PTR. So you're pointing to the location that stored the address in which the address store the result. Okay. So that's hence the name reference. So in LC3, Okay, so in this one, let's say that here they give it a four. So I is the, for the first local. So here's your local variable. Then PTR is the second offset by negative one. So we would say that I is four. So you would clear register zero. We would add four to register zero, right? Assuming that R5 is I, then we would store I to register zero, then we add them. So register zero would have the address of I. 
So at this point, it's this, this guy right here, this line. You can see it in the comment. And then we would store in the pointer by having a negative one, by offset. Okay. Then for this line, it's four lines in LC3. So when you say PTR is PTR plus one, as you store here, you got to load it. Okay. So that way, register zero would have PTR, right? We store it out, we're going to load it back. And when we load it back, we then load the content into another register by doing an LDR from register zero to register one. Then we increment it, we add it by one. Okay. Then we would store the result to register one from register zero because register zero is the middleman, right? We use it to really point to the address of the variable which stores the value. Then we gotta, because it has the, you know, the things that we need, then we gotta, we gotta bring it back. We gotta load it back and then we gotta store it out, okay? It's all about movement of data with, with assembly for most part, using memory and register and instructions. Any question with this? Okay, so here it shows you how you can use pointer as the argument. So when you, when you use pointer inside the parentheses here, that's argument, right? And then we have to push it because arguments need to go onto the stack. So you got to push it with the address. Okay. So here they use two value, value B and value A. So you would put the address at that with the register to register zero. Then you would do a push. Okay and then add the address for the value B and then a push. And then, you know, as you push, it's gonna store. Okay. Any question? Okay, all right. So let's answer the next question. In LC3 program, how is the pointer implemented? What does it contain? We should use a register to point to the address location. We need to increment in memory location as the pointer is used. We would use load and store instructions to load content and store the results between registers. So I just summarized that, but you know, if you can follow it by looking at the example provided in the notes or the presentation. And then for question six, it asks you why should pointer be passed in the function in C programming? It allows the function to read or change memory outside of its activation record. Okay. Any question with number five or and or number six? Okay. So the answer for six, you can find that here. It's on page six of your notes. Okay. And little highlight in the box here. It says arguments are integer pointers, caller 
passes the address of the variable that it wants in a function that to change. So when we use the pointer in the argument, right, it's going to pass the address of that variable. As it reads the pointer. And then the, the next part, we talked about swap already. Um, so here's another example for using pointer. And interesting enough, we already talked about how we would point, right? So earlier you saw that we would load four to so because we wanted to put four, value A is four, and, right? So we would point to the location of value A, which has four. So you would do a register load of four. Okay. So that's the first value here. So register zero actually contains this address. Okay. And register five comes from the top. So when you load, when you load this part right here, register zero with register one with the zero, it's gonna do what? For it's gonna take the first val address, okay, which is gonna be tying back to the three, which is in a temporary location because as you pass that pointer, the pointer variable, it's not included in the activation record. So it has to obtain it for, or it has to associate that with the temporary location temp map, which is here. That comes from register five. Okay. And keep in mind that this is a snippet of the program. They introduced three into that location a long time ago. Okay. So this is part of the, the stack with the swap with for the swap rules subroutine. Okay, so go through, look at each line on what they're doing here, how they're able to look at it from a pointer perspective. Just keep in mind that you, you're looking at addresses that's in the register and then be able to get it swapped there. All right, next we're gonna talk about no pointer. So we want to use a pointer that points to nothing, which is the no pointer. So we would declare on a pointer, but we're not ready to actually point to anything yet. So you can declare a pointer as a no pointer and not point it to nothing yet. So you can say that int, right, p, which is a pointer, and p is going to be no. So it contains a value that's that a non null pointer should never be hold. So it's a little bit different. Okay, because the address is zero, it's not a legal address for most program to really include. But we can use it in the program, but later on, we would have to do something with that, right? So here, this shows you how you can use the arguments in the result. You can have the return in the pointer and the return status for the function. So you can pass an address of a variable that you wanted to store the result. So that's how you can use it in the argument like this. Okay. 
So because earlier we talked about how this would be referencing the location, right, in which it stores the result. We already talked about how we would declare the pointer and then we would have, when we create the pointer, we would have a reference of it. And once we use the reference at the end, we have to dereference it, okay? So you can have the content pointed to var, which is was declared and then when you use double asterisk like this, that will be the memory location pointed to the memory, the location pointed by R. So it's twice over, hence the asterisk. Then the content of the memory location three, that will be asterisk three. Okay, so one, if, if we reference it, we have to dereference it. So for question seven, the purpose of the null pointer in C programming, it is declared when the address is not yet assigned or the address is not known. To initialize the pointer variable when the pointer variable isn't assigned with any valid address yet. It's used to check before accessing any pointer variable. So to check for no pointer before accessing any pointer variable. So it checks there first, the compiler checks there first before it's accessing any other pointer variable. So that way we can handle error in relation to the referencing pointer variable only if it's not null. And lastly, to pass to a null pointer, to pass a null pointer to a function argument, we don't want to pass any valid memory address because it's not holding anything except for zero as an address, which is not legal. So those are some of the conditions for the use of no pointer in C. This is a harder concept for beginning programming students in C++. I know that every time I teach 17A, um, students, they struggle in the null, in, in no, learning about null, learning about pointers, things like that, okay? But I hope that when we correlate this with LC3, you can see the big picture of what's happening in assembly. Question. So for question A, it asks you in C programming, what is the difference between right, the pointer and the reference variable? So for the pointer in decoration, we use the asterisk, of course, and then uh, for, so we would use asterisk var, which is how we would declare the pointer. And then for the reference, ampersand var is used for reference. A pointer needs to be dereferenced with the asterisk to access the memory location that it points to, whereas the reference can be used directly. And that's the true difference. Hey, Professor, for a lot of these, um, like, um, 
what's it called, like pre-programs that you've been showing us, they all just load into registers and store into register. But for yeah. the programs we're doing, it's better if we do it in labels, right? Yeah, so yeah. assuming that they had loaded the label to, for example, like I, earlier in the program, they didn't show you because they took a snippet of the program. So register five have I label loaded already earlier in the program, right? So when they do a, a when when they do a register load, the LDRR zero R five, all that is is bring I address over to register zero. So it points to it points to I. Okay. So you just use a register loaded with another register as you wanted to point to the location of that label. Okay. All right. Um, next, anything on pointers and reference variable? Okay. So now let's move to array. Okay, so an array, we would use it as a container to store a group of values that would be arranged sequentially in memory. And we would use the index to access each element of that container. Example, like list of phone numbers, names, values, so when we say the expression A4 refers to the fifth element of the array. So this is your index number and zero is the first element, right? Okay. So in C, you need to have the type for your array. So we would say int, that means it's gonna store integers and then the name Okay, and then the number of elements. Okay, and it has to be the same type. In Python, we will call this list. Okay, C++ has list too, slightly different, but yeah. All right, so now when we look at how we would a ranged array. So let's say that we have an array called int grid, right? Grid is going to store integers and it has 10 elements. Okay. So we would have one per, right? So it's going to cut one for element zero, next for element one, and so on up to index nine here. So we would have 10. So it says that array elements are allocated as part of the activation record, okay? So if you're using the array in your function or subroutine, right? It needs to push that onto your stack, right? When that, that subroutine is called as well. We would treat it like just a larger container compared to a variable, of course, right? So then we would start with the first element that would have the lowest address that will be allocated. And the first variable allocated. So then R5 would then point to the last one, okay, in your array, the last element in your array. So your first element has the lowest address value in that space. And the last one, so if the, if the grid is the first variable allocated, then your register five is gonna point to, right, the last element, which how, that's how it's gonna tell how many elements that you have, right, in that array. Okay. Okay, so here um, 
we would have x is grid three plus one. Okay, so what we have is because we have 10 elements and we would use nine as an index. Okay, so when you cut it, okay, you would then have it would be, you would start with lower nine, right? We would start with zero and then we would go down nine. So that's why you would subtract nine. And then if you wanted to have grid three, which is the fourth element that's gonna be loaded to register one, right? Because we wanted to have X is equal to grid three plus one. So here we want to get grid three to register one. And so that's how, because register zero is gonna represent, right? each of the elements, so we would say index three, right? Load that to register one, and then we're gonna do a plus one. So X is gonna be at register one, okay? So when we store it, we have to include all 10 because now it's a plus one. It has one more. Okay. So here they show you how you can use the reference for the array index. Okay. So when you do a grid six, so if you looking at the seventh element is gonna assign number five. Okay. So you clear register zero, you add five to register zero. And then this right, is gonna represent your array, okay? That's gonna be in register one. So R1 is gonna reference the first, the first element here. And then you're gonna take that and you're gonna store it to register zero and point to index six by doing a store six, right? and then the first index address and register zero. So from that, it's gonna know that it's gonna go to the sixth one here, right? And it's gonna have five. Question? Uh, professor? Mm -hmm. um, are you supposed to clear register one before uh, storing the, oh. I should say. Like, should you clear register one, like when you do the um, array, like for the second or no? Yeah, they don't clear it because they, they're reusing X. They're reusing X throughout because where we left off here, right? You store out X to, right? You store X as register one. Mm. So here, what they're doing is they're saying that X is the reference of the first because x is here right but you gotta go you gotta say oh you gotta give it the address for the first index in the array mm -hmm. then from there it's going to be able to increment down so it's going to find the seventh element in in that array by doing a, a store six okay and then you're still using X in this one. See how, how that is? Then they're gonna do an X plus one is gonna be X, right? The element plus two. So then what, you, what you're gonna load is you're gonna, since you load out last time, where is it? Uh, register five. Yeah, so R1, Grid. So it's here it's going to tell you the whole, the, the address of the array, like what we've done previously, but with R1. Yeah, so you store here, then when you come back here, earlier we, we store here, right, to give you X 
the, your register one is going to be X, right? And then we use that. So R1 is going to be the first address of the first element. Then we're going to take that. We're going to store it to register zero with the six. So we would access the seventh element. And then here, Oh yeah, I see what they're doing. Okay, so the R5 from up here, then since you load, you store from R5 here, then we're gonna load down here, but we're gonna bring that from register zero because where we left off with register zero, it has um, the seventh element. Okay. And notice that there are stuff that's, these are snippets too, so when we try to follow it sequentially throughout. So this section only represent this part. There's some cutoff here. That's why I was like, why is it from, okay. But you can follow from this part to this part, it's sequential. And then from this part, what it's doing is gonna be the element plus one, and then it's gonna access the element and then we're gonna do an add to. So we here is going to be our R zero is going to be X, which is right here. Okay. And then we are going to reference the first element by doing the the add with the negative nine because there are ten or nine index, ten elements. And then since we have register one, we're gonna take R zero with the R one, we're gonna add it and put it back onto register one. So that's gonna give us the reference for uh, grid for grid that would be index X. And then we would load it to register zero Okay, so now R1 and R2 both. So R1 actually have the address, R2 actually has the, the, um, the value for grid X. And then we're gonna add two because it tells us to add two here. Okay. So in any case, right, when you start your array, you see how they load this right here because it shows that there are 10 elements that puts your position for, you know, I or X or whatever. You can call it I, that will be your, your position there. And then you can, you can access it with the index or, you know, you can reference it. Okay, so you're always gonna start it like this with this line right here, like a uh, register load and then the value that represents how many of the slots you're gonna cut for each of your element. Okay, so you see the repetition index, right? And so on. So you're welcome to use this right, uh, when you're trying to implement array for your, for your program, or if you wanted to use array references, like your grade calculator or, okay. any questions with array? Um, probably like my only question is, uh, if we're going to use arrays like to input um, values from the keyboard, how would that be done? So you have to move it. Okay, so let's say that if, if you do one character at a time, right, like get C, um, it goes to register zero then you move it to another register and then store it out, okay? Or do something with that after that point, right? Um, I'd be storing it as a label? 
you can but you can put it into the location like what we've done in one of the labs or uh, I think two labs ago, lab eight, or you can do it with, um, you, can, you can put it as arbitrary, like X1, X2, X3, you know? Yeah, like what, what Ellen's saying is, is it's, if you use it with the label, right? You can, you can put, you know, in, input one, input two, input three, input four, and then you can, you can have it with the arbitrary X1, X2, X3, X4. So all that is, it's gonna increment it into the memory with the subsequent, and you would know exactly where it's located. I would do it that way. Okay, hold on one second. I'm trying to find the program for you. I think that was in the, I was in the right folder. I just I gotta go over here. Yeah, see how I have register fill like this? So you can do it that way. I think um, lab eight, when we do the bits multiplications, when we do shift and add, I did that one there too. Okay. So okay. you can, yeah, you can do it this way, but I think um, I wanted to, to find that one. Hold on one second. It's going to drive me crazy because um, I don't, I wanted to show you exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think it's this one. So you can do it with the, the save register this way. That will be more permanent and see, this is, this is what I'm talking about. So you would just fill it like that. But even if you fill it with like, you know, X0, X0, that's just gonna give you the location subsequently because it's gonna offset from one and then it's gonna cut it to the next. Now, the way that the example is showing you in the presentation and in the notes, um, what they did was they had used register and to be able to, um, when we look at this, okay, um, keep in mind that they already loaded X earlier in the program, like I set or I see that because snippet of the program and our internet's out And it's very laggy. Okay. So yeah, it's laggy. Okay. Okay. 
Is it better now? No. Okay, there again. Okay, so the way that they have it is that um, they already loaded X to register five earlier, or they, you know, so they had this set up already. And then, so when you, when you go into this program, when they do the load register to register, they would just um, did an LDR here. But so there are several approach in how you can set up the array. If you follow this format, just keep in mind that you have to be able to prep X, okay? And all this is, is that this is gonna be your variable and you would use that as a, a pointer or reference variable to an array. Okay. And then you would be able to access the indices by using that variable. So as you can see here, they go through, right? And they would reference each of the index, like index zero, and then the next one, and then the next one, and so on. So you can use this as an example, or if you're more comfortable doing with the fill address, I'm fine with that, okay? But keep in mind that if you don't move the input, it's gonna get overwritten for the next input, okay? So if you do get C, get C, get C, what happened is register zero is you're just gonna keep storing the update. So you do a get C, get from register zero, move it out to another register and then, you know, and then another get C and so on. So as it runs it, the user will not know the difference in the lag, right? Okay. All right, let's talk about string real quick and then we'll, we'll tidy up, we finish up the, the session. So we've done string. Okay, um, now in the case that if you wanted to access each of the character in the string, you can, you can use the string as an array of characters and then be able to access each of the, the character that way, just like how it shows here. You would do, you know, that string name and then the indices, okay? And this is basically C, scan F and printf. Okay, so for the array, we would use the index value and that goes into the square brace or we would say that this, when we declare that, that will be the number of elements, okay? Or we can access each element by using the indices there. Okay, now what the difference that can be between the array and the pointer is that you can change the content, right, of the, the PTR the, that points to that particular object versus where if you are looking at the array, right, uh, when, when you assign the value, those value will be very static, okay? So the best way, if you think about like a grade calculation program as it would be input, right? It could be input in different value. You don't hard code in those values. So it would be more feasible for us to think about a dynamic array or a location, how it's gonna point to each of the value. And you, you know, when you cut the array, it will be sequential location for the elements, okay? and then be able to retrieve it by accessing the indices. So for the array, there's some limitation with the array. It tells you here that there's no checking at the runtime, that the compiler time to see whether the difference between the array bounds. Um, Now, the last thing here is when they talk about pointer arithmetic for LC3. 
So the address calculation depends on the size of ele your elements, okay? So we would assume that one word per element, but as long as that it fits into one word per element, like the type. So in the int and the char, each of the element would take up one word, 16 bits. If you have a double, then you need to add eight to find the address of the fourth element so we can locate double word per element. So when you're using a bigger type, data type, you have to make sure that you allocate more than one word per element in LC3. That's what it's saying, okay? So that really depends on the type size. So when we say double X here for the 10, we would do two words per element because it's larger. So that way you can hold larger number, okay? So earlier when we say that, oh, well, we're just gonna cut it so if we're saying 10 elements this way, if we're gonna grid it like this, so two, two locations is gonna be one element, okay? So when you set this up, it's gonna be negative 20 instead of negative 10, understand? Two per element, okay? So that kind of changes on how you would then section each of the slot, which is two words per element for a larger type. So that's, there's like a physical component with LC3 where, you know, that, that is managed by the compiler that you see here in this class. Okay. Um, so I wanted to say for the next part, for eight, we already answer eight, nine, LC3, how do you create an element, a 10 element array? You would use registers to point to the first and the last index of the array on the memory grid you would increment by adding one to increase memory grid for each index. That's assuming that if it's char or int, right? Equivalent. So if it's the smaller data type, we would use one word per and we would do a one, one increment. But if it's a double or a larger data type, then you have to do, you know, two words or bigger. Like if we say, you know, long or then you want to allocate multiple words per element. Then you have to do a multiply, you have to add two instead of one, okay? So if your base address of your, of your word is, if your base address is hex, sorry, I forgot the X here, hex 31 F zero, for the allocate word for each element, what is the address for the sixth element of the array? Okay, you can look at slide 28 for chapter 16 presentation. I put a note there, so in case you need to reference it. So the address calculations, depending on the size of the element, like what I mentioned before, in your LC3 code, we assume that it is one word per element. If that's the case, if you need to find the six element, we would add four to the base address, okay? And so that will be 31F4. Now, if you are using a double type, right? Then we would do a hex 31 F zero plus eight. 
which give you hex 31 FP. Oh, it's asking for the six element, I'm sorry. I was right the first time. I apologize for the confusion. So here you would add a 12, which is XB. Any question? Wouldn't that be a, an XC instead of a B? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. B Thank is you. 11. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Long day. All right, 11, if you use the base address hex 31 FA to allocate the double word for each element, what is the address of the fifth element of the array so for the double word like what i showed in the previous one five times two is going to be ten so you would do a hex 31 fa plus a 10 which gives you hex 3204 that will be the location for your fifth element in the array so now you understand how to use address when you fill, right? So earlier you guys asked me, oh, well, can I just fill it, right? Like how we would look at some of the earlier program. So if you wanted to fill it to an actual physical address, then you just pre-calculate out your, your address uh, for each of the elements. So we would be sequential, right? Like, so the fourth one, if we're using the double, that will be two prior. So it will be, um, so it will be something like this, right? Your fourth element, let's say we would do a dot fill, right? Hex 3202. And then the fifth element, dot fill, hex, 3204 and so on. That's if you decide to use the space address. If you use 3100, then you just increment it. One for the smaller data type and double for the larger data type. That gives you 32 bits, right, and so on. Any question? Okay, so this concludes chapter 14 and 16. We still have two more to cover next week. Again, there's no lab this week. I put a page there. So in case, you know, people who don't attend look, um, but if you have questions, let me know, show up to the lab session and we'll talk. Okay, make sure you sign up for your team um, and then communicate with your team and start working on your project. And you can look at example, I'm sure you do online and various things, but you cannot use their code, okay? So try to be able to solve it with your group um, and think about how you would move and use data uh, with LC3. Type your name in the chat, please. Have a good evening. I'll stick around for a little bit if you have questions. And Eric won the last game review thing. So I sent Eric a card, but we have one more and then we would try to go for that one later okay take care everyone good night hey professor i had a quick good question night. on the uh, project
Sure. Um, so me and my partner are doing option B, the grades uh, calculator, right? Um, I just wanted to clarify, did you want us to input the grades directly into this simulator or through the console and write the uh, code to take in the inputs? So it should ask the user via the console to input in their grades, five grades, right? right. And, and then calculate it and then give the, the, the average, the minimum, the highest grade. And then, you know, the complete yeah. program should give you the grade equivalent in letters. Um, I've had students turn in just numbers because they just didn't have time or they couldn't do the, the last part. But if you want the complete program. So if my average is 83, um, mm -hmm. then it would just and you wanted to to, you know, you wanted to round it off. OK, because I know that when we deal with, you know, values, it's going to there's no float in LC3. So you just wanted to just so convert. So when it's equal to this, then you just convert it to a letter grade. And then you said that, you know, your average grade is an A and so on. OK, so, uh, do you want us to do pluses and minuses or just the letter? That's up to you, really. I think okay. implementing pluses and minuses require a lot more work in that right. you have to range it differently. Um, so I will be happy with just whole letter grade. Like if you say 90 to 100 is an A, I'm fine with that. And you can you should display that too if you wanted to be more fancy with it. You can say that this is the range and your average grade is an A. Okay. Alrighty, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Take care. Other questions? Oh, hey, Professor. Sure. Um, me and my group, um, well, we're kind of interested in the bubble sorting um, project, but we wanted to know like how difficult it actually is because I do know that it requires like two um, for loops and an if statement. Uh, one second. Let me get to my REPL and I'll show you how the C++ would look. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the C++ and you think you can do it in, a, that is one of the harder ones, I, in my opinion, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's been done before in the, for this class with LC3. So... Um, so perfect for today because we talked about swap positions. Okay, so let me screen share. This is the one that I used for my 17A class. Just perfect for what we talked about today. Um, yeah, so we prototyped the function here. So basically I have um, you have to sort, so you would need to have subroutine to sort mm -hmm. um, and then subroutine to show, okay? Mm -hmm. And in this one, does it does a swap. Um, so I, you know, it would then, you can initialize it, but since you are, we, we require that the user does the input, so you would take one input, can ASCII convert it, you know, move it, and then take the next one. So you just require, just test it with a few input first and then be able to achieve it, okay? So now um, for the function, so what I with with the bub the bubble sort is that you wanted to make sure that there's a swap mechanism, um, in that mm -hmm. it would it would be able to move it to the temp locations and then be able to move it back as it swap out, you know the when it exchanged the location. So if you write it in C++ like this, and you can, there are tons of example online, sure you can look at, um, mm -hmm. but yes, I do agree that you have to implement loop. And yeah. so I don't think it's that hard actually. For loop is easy to do. You just mm -hmm. count it down, you initialize I, right? And then you add in the, the, um, the count, which is gonna be your N value. That's gonna be, you know, 
however many, many numbers that you have, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then update it. Just so, yeah, um, I, I I like to see it. <laughs> and so then, we would we have enough time then? Oh sure. Time. So what I would do is first I would set it up like okay. mm -hmm. so first break it up in into three pieces. Okay. First, you're going to think about the interface, which is where you would take in the value. So mm -hmm. once you achieve that and store the value into the array, then move to the next task is to be able to, you know, sort the array. Then once you sort the array, then write the next, the third stage is going to be display the array. Mm -hmm. And that would just give you two subroutines. So you would do a two JSR and then a bunch of labels within. Um, now, if you wanted to implement input validations and all of that good stuff, sure, I don't require that as long as you can like, so this, the last part is the display. So that mm -hmm. means that you have to, if you're using a pointer, you just point it back to the locations of where, how it was sorted because technically the computer doesn't arrange anything. If we're using the pointer, we just associated the 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 sequence differently so mm -hmm. so you just point it to you know index zero as the new updated value that's sorted and so on oh, okay. okay you know so yeah. it depends on how you want to approach that so once so i would do it in three parts right write the first part uh make sure you store all the input into the array if you can do that then that's easy for you, then you should move on to the next one, then you would do the sort. That's the big heart of, of your program. Mm -hmm. So once it's sorted, right, then you just, you can use the pointer to point to the location as you, you, you have a function or a subroutine that would be displaying each of the elements. Um, and then that's it. And then convert it, forgot, ASCII convert it and display it out. So it oh, should okay. show. It should show your array sorted. Um, I I want you to you guys to solve it, but I do have example programs that the students turn in. Um, I think Kevin's group uh, was the one that did it last year, and then another group did it the other year. Um, mm -hmm. So bubble sorts that it, it's not a popular choice because it's a harder one, but mm -hmm. if you think about it logically, it's it's not that bad. Okay. 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 So look at some C++ example. That's going to help you kind of break it down how you want to write an L3. All right, Ben. All right, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, we just get really got to think about it. <laughs> so do by stage because if you try to do it all at once, I'm going to tell mm. you it's it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna be very difficult. Mm. Okay. I had student that turn in a thousand and one line in LC3. I previously required them to do a regular calculator, like just arithmetic calculator. And one of the group turned in like a thousand something lines for it. So it does like multiplication, addition, subtraction, uh, mod, stuff like that, which I cover mm -hmm. all of it already. And then other things like percentage and. Okay. Okay. Let me know if you have questions. I think that's all for now. Okay.